In Christ, the ever-blessed one, dearly beloved faculty and staff, and friends of the congregation. It is never a coincidence that the lessons that fall throughout the church year and are appointed in a three-year cycle always seem to fit perfectly with what we need to hear and to say to one another. This Sunday for the installation of staff members and faculty happened to fall on this day simply by dint and convenience of the calendar that needed to fit all sorts of events into September and as usual throughout the rest of the church's year of grace. And yet we have a lesson, lessons, but a lesson in the Holy Gospel that is well suited to remind us all about the task we take up not only each day, but particularly in St. Luke Academy. Jesus, that most excellent of teachers, was on his way with his disciples, alone we are told, because he was taking the time to teach them what they needed to know to carry out the mission that would be committed into their hands after Jesus' ascension and fully on the day of Pentecost. He shares with them that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after being killed, he will rise again. And then the Gospel says so nonchalantly, but they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask. We can all relate to that. We've all been students who have heard our teacher or professor say this or that to us, and we don't really know if we want an answer or we should ask a question or what we should do. It's no different in any of the classes, in our religion classes, you can ask, what's the first commandment? Silence. Now, they could be afraid, they might not know, but that was the problem the disciples had. And as teachers, you frequently encounter that problem. Silence leaves everyone somewhat safe, unless, of course, the teacher goes over and singles somebody out and looks deeply for that answer for which you had asked a question. Or on the other side, how often do we listen to what's going on, whether it's in the classrooms here or in the classrooms of life? at work, in the government, in the community. How often do we listen, but we get fearful about raising our hand and asking, why should that be? Who do you propose this program for? What are the benefits? What are the costs? So frequently in all of those situations, like the disciples, we keep quiet. We're not sure to ask. We're not sure if we even want to hear the answer. And for those disciples, why would they want to hear any answer? What, what is this, their teacher? He's going to die and rise again? It made absolutely no sense at all. So discretion said to them, let's not get into it. Maybe 
there'll be a clarifying statement later on when Jesus has a more lucid moment. I'm sure that's what they think. And don't do we also think that way? We don't like necessarily what God suggests and demands that we do. And so we take a moment. We don't ask any questions, hoping that either what we thought or the requests that were made will go away or someone else will take up the task. There's always a couple of children in the classroom who will get the rest of the bunch off the hook because they raise their hand all the time. And the rest of the class is deeply grateful. They don't say anything, but they have their hand up all the time. Most of us, we don't want to ask. We don't want to tell. We don't want to do a whole lot of anything. And the disciples were like that, that kind of fear of the unknown that can paralyze and cripple. What they weren't afraid of is to try and figure out why they didn't want to deal with what the teacher had said to them. They weren't afraid of trying to figure out who's first. You know how that goes. You have children from the preschool on up. They come already knowing what the first position is. They may not be able to count, but they know where the front of the line is where the first place is to get a snack or to go to recess. It's built into their genes and ours as well. We gravitate toward being first, being ahead of others, being in the fast lane, the first car out of the red light, the first one in line, the first one to get a new iPhone. And we line up deep as can be for some of these fleeting and material joys. Doesn't matter whether you're a child or an adult. And Jesus senses that. You know, like the good teacher, you've asked your classes, who said that? What are you doing? And again, the great silence ensues. Nobody was saying anything. Nobody was doing anything. Nobody knows anything in the classroom. And it's not just the upper grades. The younger ones, as the preschool teachers will share with you, if you stop back after church for a reception, they can tell you the stories too about how clever the three and four-year-olds are as they go about their daily business. It's a challenge a challenge that Jesus took up and that our faculty and staff in this congregation takes up to let people know what God would have us do and say and how we should live. Jesus then, as you know, points to a child. He puts a child in their midst and says, you want to be great, you want to be first, be like this child. And in biblical times, children had absolutely no standing, no place. To the extent that they were useful for labor or other things like that, they might have found some place in society. Otherwise, half the time they were cast out and set aside. But Jesus picks one of them and says to them, this is what you have to be like in your faith, in your understanding, in your trust of God. And he puts his arms around them, takes them up and says, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. 
God in heaven. And so as a congregation and the staff, we seek to welcome those children and families who want to know and may not, or who do know and need a refresher, or who are living in the light of God's love, we invite them and their children to come and to let Christ pick them up, train, nurture, develop, love. Pick them up through your hands as teachers so they learn not only what it means to live today and to know those life lessons that are absolutely essential to survive in our society, but to teach them the lessons of eternity that are absolutely essential if children are to thrive, not only today, but forever. And that goes for us all. God picks you and me up, and through our hands, we surround the ministries God has given to us in the academy, in our senior care, at our cemetery, in this congregation. It is our hands, not somebody else's, not the one kid in the class who always has his hand up and lets us off the hook. None of us get a pass. Our hands are there to lift each other up. Our hands are there to lift up those who have been beaten down and broken by the things that happen in this life. Our hands are there to surround all our ministries, and in particular, our teachers, with that love that Christ showed for a child. And when we do that, we not only fulfill the command of Christ, we welcome him, but we embrace that God who has created everything and made us one. So we celebrate. It is interesting that each lesson carries a piece of instruction, not only for staff and faculty, but for all of us. The prophet Jeremiah reminds us, for to you I have committed my cause. We need to remember that when our ministries lack funding, when our enthusiasm wanes, and when we don't know what the next day will bring. We are committed to the cause that God gives us in Jesus Christ. And in the letter to James, that ends, submit yourselves therefore to God, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We do that individually so that together in the sharing of peace, in the breaking of bread, in our prayers, in our hymns, we all draw near to God so we can draw this community, the students in our school, our seniors, everyone we encounter, draw them in to know and celebrate the love of God. And all of that as we remember Christ's example. A small child, not left standing alone, but one that Jesus picks up, holds before us that childlike faith and power that enables you and me to support the ministry committed to you and in turn to give glory to God 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.